Brad Blanks, I'm here with... Guillermo del Toro. Now, Mr. Del Toro, uh, you've stuck your finger into a lot of pies over the years. That sounds Would... terrible. <laughs> But, but let's give the, yeah. What sort of pies have you? And then exactly. Well, yeah. Let's, let's give right. An acclaimed director who's now put out a book. Uh, is this kind of like an actor who wants to become a musician? Uh, a comedian that wants to play drama? Yeah. No, I really, I really, uh, I've, I've written all my life. I've written short stories. I wrote. Uh, uh, I I never written a novel. I wrote um, uh, a book on Hitchcock that was published in Spain and Mexico and. Uh, I have written and co-written 17 screenplays, but uh, the tragedy of the projects that don't get made uh, is that they uh, they languish on a drawer and they're not never going to be found, you know? So I, 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 let's say I've written those 17 screenplays and I've done only seven films. That means there are 10 stories that I, I think uh, are really strong and powerful and I cannot tell them to the world. Many of them are not translatable to novel form because they are depending solely on cinematic stuff. But this one could be, and I really wanted to to uh, get it to, to to find an audience. And mercifully, I I was able to to find the time, the way, and the partnership with Chuck Ho and to co-write it together. Now, uh, from what we gather, uh, the book it has uh, vampire elements in it. Can you tell me how this book kicks off the the plot? Well, the, the, it starts with a 747 going going uh, dark on the tarmac in the airport and completely st coming to a standing still. And uh, it, uh, it goes off and then the CDC uh, surrounds the plane and they try to, uh, they find it closed from the inside. All the windows are drawn. And finally, when they are giving up, the door opens from the inside, you know. And everybody inside, unfortunately, is dead. So uh, the, the two questions are who opened the door and who, what killed all the passengers. They find a few survivors and then what they realize uh, soon enough is that they are facing a pandemic of what essentially they have to come uh, to terms is vampirism. Vampires on the town. Yeah, vampires uh, uh, and not the sparkly kind either. <laughs> Now, how do you handle it as a writer, as a man who's bringing a book out of vampires? You could well be bringing a book out on vampires in the middle of the most hysteria pop culturally about this genre. Well, you know, we, we are, I really haven't read the Twilight books. I, I, we can joke about it, but I haven't. And, and uh, I, I simply don't jibe with the romantic vampire. I, I, I think that, for example, Anne Rice books are really good. I like the the uh, interview with the vampire, vampire Lestat, but it's not the stuff I get my rocks off. Mm -hmm. I actually like disgusting, absolutely frightening, undead corpses coming after your blood. <laughs> you know, as a fat man, I think uh, I think I, I think of myself as a morsel. <laughs> you know, but 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 I really love the idea of scary, really scary, completely animalistic, brutal vampires. Well, uh, but what sort of morsels do you think uh, you'd be? What, how tasty are you? A blood sausage of the largest uh, denomination. No, but I, I think I think that uh, beautiful big blood sausage that a vampire would love to get his teeth into. And, and, and yes, indeed. But 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 the other thing that I like uh, about this is I've been keeping notes about vampire biology and anatomy for so many years. Some of it found it, it, its way to Chrono. Some of it found its way to Blade Two. But this is the first time I, I've been able to kind of uh, articulate it uh, the way I want to. Anyone, I mean, I'm sitting here going, I'm talking with a man, I, I know your work and you're a genius and all that, but you have actually kept notes on vampires at the moment where you sneak away to your den and just write some little notes on them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whenever, I mean, I have, I literally have a house um, that is a library. The whole house, and and uh, I do have a den that you access through a secret bookshelf, and I, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'll, I've been living a, a dark fantasy all my life, and as a kid, I dreamt of the house I have now, you know, which is a man cave. My family home is is close by, but they, I live separately from that, and and and, uh, and I always dreamt of that. I. I now have the possibility and the, the the beautiful experience of buying original 18th century manuscripts on vampirism and the occult and uh, you know on on uh, spells and witchcraft and all this stuff and and I enjoy spending my time there. And have you thrown all the vamp vampire stuff out the window? Like uh, you've cut it back to how vampires can be killed. I mean, in this book. 
Yeah, but uh, uh, we can only kill them in, in a way that, because this is a medical thriller. I mean, it's written like a medical thriller. You have to come to that conclusion um, through a logical, you know, they're, they're not going to be scared of a cross or a star of David. It makes no difference. But uh, garlic is chemically powerful for them. And, uh, uh, you know, silver is, is also a, um, a, a weapon. A lot of people think, and, and they are completely wrong, for example, a lot of people think that uh, it's a confusion. The silver is a confusion and an inheritance from a werewolf mythology. But in reality, in old Eastern European lore, uh, a sword or a dagger made of silver or nails made of silver cool. could be used to kill a vampire. Really? Yeah. And yourself, do you still eat garlic? Or every time you bite into a piece of garlic, do you have thoughts of vampires? Yeah. No, I don't believe. I, I believe they are uh, real in the collective imagination, <laughs> but I have no delusions uh, of them being real. And your man cave, do you ever hear a ring at the doorbell and let people in, or are you completely uh, no, locked no. away in this this amazing no, man cave? No, no. I mean, now and then um, I get visitors, and uh, what is great is uh, the neighbors think I am insane, so they don't come close. To me. And I have a little, I have a little sign outside the door that says "Bleak House." <laughs> and so you know, like with little chirpy birds, uh, and then the, the the kind that you put, God bless this home. You know, it says bleak house. Bleak, it's bleak. It's a macabre house. And uh, you haven't had any rent. The police haven't knocked on the door before and said, "What's going on in there?" No, because when we were moving in, I had a, a rotten corpse that that was in Hellboy One. Yeah. And I had the rotten corpse by the window for the first two weeks when we were moving in. So literally, uh, the guy that does the garden tells me that the neighbors ask, uh, you work for the crazy guy that lives in it? That they don't know. I mean, they, they think I'm a serial killer. <laughs> Well, uh, I look forward to uh, them having a read of the, the book. Oh, yeah. They're going to run me out of the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, in final words, New York City is the backdrop for this book. Um, why did you choose New York? When I was a kid, uh, I was a very young guy in the 1980s, and, uh, and I had funny hair. And, and I, I came to New York, and I was walking around. You were a punk. I, I was a punk. I was, you know that? Yeah, with glasses, which was a tragedy. A punk with glasses is quite a tragedy. <laughs> so you're in the mosh pit jamming in your glasses. <laughs> Pretty sad. But hey, I did have my, a dog chain. Right, you did? Uh, yes, yeah. yes and, a, and, a, and a lock. And you wore your dog, dog chain in New York? I did, I probably did. I probably set up the metal detectors. But I, I was walking around Central Park and I, I saw a, a big building with a copper roof. And I and I thought a vampire lives there, and and it started like that. I mean, I, I thought about it. And back then, what were you other than a punk? You weren't. Were you writing? Oh, I, I was writing and directing short, very strange films. Right, yeah. by yourself or you? Yeah, yeah, yeah I did. Yeah. I I've been doing Super Eight movies since I was eight. Right. Oh, really? Yeah. So you know, I I did. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a couple that are, there's are in the DVDs of my movies. They're incredibly stinky shorts. Right. Yeah. Well, um. I'm sure they're not. I'm sure they're brilliant. No, they probably roll out at the man cave. <laughs> crab, a filming piece of crab. You should have a short film party at the man cave. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Drink some blood. <laughs> you, would, you would need a lot of tequila. Yeah. Well, one of the greats, uh, Mr. Del Toro, <laughs> thank you very much. Bye-bye. Right, well, we better tell them to buy the book, The Strain. Yeah, that's it. Go get it. <laughs> Thanks, buddy.